here for. So um, we have never uh, officially met before, but um, I understand that you're originally from Japan and you've moved around to the US and you're currently at UBC in Canada, is that right? Yeah, that's correct. That's great, good. And uh, I do have this book <laughs> that was written by you on race, culture, and identities and second language acquisition. But this book is already quite old. It was published in 2009. And I know that you've been working on this topic much longer than that and on critical topics in general. Um, so I'm very much looking forward to your talk today on anti-racism in teaching education. And I think it will be very enlightening for everyone. So uh, welcome everyone and please enjoy the talk. Thank you very much, Jocelyn. Um, actually, uh, Sue Motha and I are trying to co-edit a new book <laughs> on race and language education. So um, I don't think it will be available until uh, late next year or the year after next, but um, it will take for a while, but we are working on it. <laughs> so anyway, um, so can I share my screen now? Yes, okay. Can you see it? Yes? Okay. All right. So uh, let me begin. Um, so my name is Ryoko Kuboda, and I'm going to talk about enacting anti-racism in teaching English. But first of all, um, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me event and also um, in Canada we do land acknowledgement so I would like to acknowledge that I'm on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of Hankaminam speaking Musqueam people and um, I'm here at a University of British Columbia campus. Um, so there has been um, increased attention to anti-racism and social justice in TESO. So uh, this is my topic today. So, um, so for the outline today, um, I'm going to talk about foundations of anti-racism in teaching English. Um, I would say critical anti-racism. And also, uh, next, I'm going to uh, talk about a study on African-American female teachers of English in South Korea, a study that I conducted uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with another um, uh, collaborator and conclusion. So first, um, let me look at uh, foundations of anti-racism in English language um, teaching. Uh, I'm going to look at uh, five. First, race is a social construct. Second, Racism is manifested in different forms. Third, racism is not the only cause of oppression. Uh, we need to look at intersectionality. Fourth, anti-racism should be decolonized. And fifth, racism outside of North America and language education should be focused on. So uh, let's take a look at uh, these topics one by one. So the first um, topic is that this is a social construct. So uh, the first question is what is race? Is actually a social construct rather than biologically determined because the genetic makeup of all humans is 9% identical to uh, research evidence. So, um, it's often believed that Asians are good at math, but actually they are socially, culturally, and institutionally expected, and they tend to fulfill that expectation. Another stereotype is that um, Black people are fast runners. Actually, dominate sprint events, and there's some scientific evidence that people 
people of uh, West African origin are genetically advantaged. But then do black athletes from Nigeria, Senegal, Guinea, Sierra Leone, Liberia, et cetera, predominate international sports events? I'd say no. So here too, um, economic, social, and historical factors influence the uh, racial of the athletes. So it might be interesting to discuss with your students about the racial representations of swimmers, leaders versus basket players and so uh, we can say that uh, racial uh, difference uh, that we perceive are not biologically based, economically and historically, and also ideologically constructed. But racial uh, difference in appearance is real and it becomes a cause of stereotypes and discrimination. So the second point is that uh, there are different types of racism. So racism usually evokes um, uh, individual um, or interpersonal racism with uh, racial minorities as seen in overt racial slurs, um, violence and insulting behaviors and so forth. So these are overt forms of racism, but there are also forms of racism. They are often called microaggressions. For instance, in the by Ina Lee, um, 2011, in Canada, an Asian Canadian native English speaking teacher was asked by many of her colleagues, where are you really from? Additionally, she was often mistaken for a student and she was included in a student group photo for program advertisement. So this is really disheartening. But a more uh, serious form of racism is maybe uh, what's called systemic institutional racism that exists in our social systems. For instance, um, some groups of un, um, some groups are underrepresented or overrepresented. Um, or included or excluded in the structures of education, healthcare, business, media, politics, sport, entertainment, incarceration, and more, right? So um, an example of systemic racism in language is recruiting and hiring teachers. So in English teaching, and Eve's um, 2004 in Tiso Quarterly article uh, demonstrated that um, higher um, hiring preference is often given to white native English speaking teachers from inner circle countries. So uh, this perpetuates racial linguistic stereotyping. But why do people prefer white native English speaking teachers? Because they believe English teachers should be white native English speakers. So the problem is not just about the structure or systemic racism per se, but it's also in our head or in our. So um, this leads to the next type of racism, which is epistemological racism or racism uh, or racial biases ingrained in our knowledge system. So it's like, uh, it's like a lens through which we see and interpret uh, social, cultural, historical products, practices, and perspectives. Um, so for, in for instance, when we select teaching materials or when we cite someone in our paper, what selection criteria do we use? Do we always select pictures of white people or materials represent uh, Western culture? Do we cite white Euro-American male authors rather than women authors of color? Our choice uh, can lead to normalizing the hierarchies of race, gender, language, and so on, which further feed to systemic racism. 
And also an, an important point is that anyone uh, can be complicit with white epistemological racism. So when people of color like and don't challenge white supremacy, then racism is invisible. In fact, color doesn't necessarily anti-racist. So the next important concept is intersectionality. So race with other identity categories like race, uh, gender, class, ethnicity, language, and sexuality. So uh, intersectionality was proposed uh, by Kimberly Crenshaw and uh, other people in American legal studies uh, to understand uh, especially marginalized experiences of African-American women, which are not identical with uh, experiences of uh, black men or white women. Also, intersectionality should not be understood as categorical or additive, but rather it's a high dynamics. It's a, a more complex uh, dynamic system. Intersectionality is an important concept in a study that I'm going to talk about in a Next, um, anti-racism should be decolonized. And th this is more in settler uh, colonial societies like US, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. So anti-racist efforts are often made by people of color, uh, like myself, who are oppressed. Yet indigenous peoples have lived on our land for centuries. Under colonialism, settlers have stolen their land, exterminated their lives, and wiped out their cultures and languages. So not only white settlers, but many settlers of color, including people like me, also have benefited economically from settler colonialism. So in advocating anti-racism, it's necessary to recognize and question our own privilege. Finally, um, anti-racism need to be addressed um, outside of North America in uh, language education, especially EFL, um, uh, with a caveat that uh, the concept of race or racism are not understood universally. So this leads to uh, anti-Black racism in Asia. Okay. So Rivers and Ross um, in their study um, uh, conducted a um, uh, uh, survey, uh, I think it was a survey, with uh, 20 uh, Japanese, uh, Jap Japanese university students. So uh, they showed um, these photos, presumably native English speaking teachers, and asked do you want these teachers as your English teacher, English language teachers? Why or why not? So these are all presumably uh, native English speaking teachers. Okay. So the result showed that uh, students overall preferred white teachers. So number two, right? And as their reasons, they described a white speaking teachers positively, like these are the um, descriptors. Um, Asian and black teachers were described. Um, there's no negative descript uh, descriptors for white native speakerhood. Um, look at um, uh, black native um, speaking uh, teachers. Uh, were labeled as uh, looking African, uh, which in a minute. So um, here, perceived racial identity influences the perceived legitimacy of English language teachers. So this leads to our empirical study. Okay. So this study is on data generated by Yanjo uh, Seo. Uh, collaborated with Yang Zhou uh, on uh, uh, theory and data analysis. Uh, um, we published this paper uh, in 
language, culture, and curriculum. And this is uh, part of the special issue, um, racialized teaching of English in Asian contexts. Um, so the data for our study uh, came from YouTube videos created by YouTubers who were African-American women teachers of English. Yeah. A similar study uh, was done by Quinisha Charles and published in Tissot Journal, uh, Black Teachers of English in South Korea. So if you're interested, please take a look at that too. Uh, it's very important to talk about our positionality. So Yanju um, has lived um, as a majority member in Korea before she moved to the United States as a graduate student. So she said, I'm quoting, um, my own challenges in a white dominant culture um, became of my race, gender, city studies. Marginalized experiences in the United States, the socially underprivileged made me conscious of in which I had previously taken such as marginalized groups of people, especially Black people, who are often targets of racial discrimination in Korean society. I'm an assistant professor now in Korea, uh, intercultural education with uh, language teaching training. So I am originally from Japan and scholar in critical applied linguistics, anti-race and uh, second language education. Taught in higher education in the United States for more than 30 years. So as an established scholar, I'm free and economically privileged, but also marginalized due to my race, gender, and language in white English dominant societies. As such, I have relationship of uh, a relation of how black female English study who are younger novice female teachers of English from African American background. So for, for both, both of us, East Asian women's use of intersectionality as a research tool can be seen as contentious given the controversy, controversy over the perceived ownership of the concept of intersectionality, which I'm going to mention next. So we are aware of the potential criticism of our focus on studying the other or black women rather than the more familiar self um, through insider research. We acknowledge the importance of uh, remaining vigilant about the power dynamics. At the same time, we hope that our analysis through our uh, specific will shed light on uh, racialization and racism that exists in language education outside of North America, particularly in this case, South, South Korea. So about this study. So the setting is South Korea and the program is called uh, English Program in Korea or EPIC, uh, which was in 1994 five and recruits native English speaking teachers um, to provide uh, Korean elementary school teachers, uh, uh, students with um, authentic language. So teachers are, are recruited from seven countries, including Australia, Canada, Ireland, New Zealand, United Kingdom, United States, and South Africa. So little is required of the applications besides being a native speaker of English and have educated since the seventh grade in one of those countries. It must have a degree, but a teaching is not required. So um, three African-American features of EPIC uh, um, so they were Brianna, Croy, and Kayla. Um, for uh, YouTube 
which are available YouTube. Um, we don't necessarily have to use the pseudonyms, but um, we use pseudonyms uh, just because uh, we're cautious of um, intended um, concept. So, um, uh, a total of were selected among approximately 300 uh, YouTube identified the uh, online search uh, with big teachers in Korea and Black women uh, from 2015 to early 2020. So the criteria included talking about top um, everyday life teaching and awkward experience related to being black women in Korea. You know, these uh, YouTubers talk about the whole things. Uh, we just wanted to focus on uh, this topic. And um, uh, we were also um, uh, interested in uh, the evidence of sincere and candid attitudes in creating and sharing their stories because they're eager to uh, increase total view counts by uploading provocative comments. And comments. Uh, we wanted to focus on candid um, and uh, expressions of their um, experiences. Okay, um, so we analyze these uh, 12 um, YouTube videos um, with picture uh, that you see here it has nothing to do with those uh, three women I just uh, copied uh, from another uh, YouTube video. And um, so, uh, okay, so um, we, uh, ask these questions. Um, so what views and experience African-American women epic teachers share on their online videos? And how do their online text their intersecting subjectivities regarding race, color, language, gender, and nationality, as well as privilege? And so, analyze the data and generated themes. Uh, one, uh, linguistic privilege as American Native English speakers. Two, uh, reported and conceptualized experiences with racial discrimination in a homogeneous country. And third, struggling with uh, Korean beauty standards. Okay. Uh, the um, before um, uh, presenting our findings, uh, it's important to uh, talk about a little bit of intersectionality. Um, we use as a conceptual framework. The notion of uh, intersectionality became illuminated with the publication of Kimberly Crenshaw, uh, African American uh, female legal scholar in the United States. Um, she highlighted the multi dimensionality of Black women's lived experiences to describe and analyze their experiences of oppression. So as intersectionality became a popular concept to discuss, the theory has actually traveled um, across academic disciplines and geographical locations, as well as uh, from academic units to management offices within a university. So Salem um, describes intersectionality as traveling theory by on uh, Saeed's uh, 1982 essay on traveling theory, in which Saeed uh, discussed theory transfers across disciplines, but is confronted by both uh, conditions of acceptance and resistances. So how has intersectionality traveled? So our literature review indicated that uh, original intention to promote social justice for Black women. Um, so the stretch in the application of the intersectionality to um, maleness, uh, whiteness, or even heterosexuality, or uh, European feminist 
being uh, without a focus on race or neoliberal universities appropriation in the name of diversity. So there was a uh, this was felt as resulting in uh, depoliticization of the concept, concept and uh, displacement of uh, Black women from the theoretical ownership of intersectionality. Uh, Jennifer Nash eked some Black feminists' uh, defensiveness to rescue the theory as their own property. She also prioritized the potential essentialization of Black women as belonging, belonging to a monolithic group. She pointed out that their experiences are complicated by class, nationality, language, ethnicity, and sexuality, and to pay attention to the ways in which privilege and oppression perceive informing each subject's experiences. But little is known what happens to intersectionality when Black physically travel across national borders to work in a different uh, geographical location. So we focused on African-American women who have traveled to uh, Korea to uh, with a perceived privileged Entity as native English speakers and examined intersectional uh, subjectivities of race, gender, language, and nationality, as well as oppression and privilege, uh, which are all situated in a new social, cultural, and historical locations. So the uh, sorry. Uh, so again, <laughs> so these were the um, research questions, and uh, we had those themes. Um, so the first theme, uh, privilege, uh, American native speakers of English. So um, all three women were qualified to apply to EPIC as native speakers of English from the United States. So along with the easy access or uh, sorry, easy process securing English teaching jobs in Korea, Kayla mentioned the financial benefits and favorable favorable working conditions uh, that um, EPIC teachers had. So let's listen to her. If you choose not to go for this opportunity, you would be a fool. I say that because there are jobs that give you the benefit that teachers gives you especially just came out of college with maybe minimal uh, in the working field or maybe even just a little bit of interning here this is you'd be stupid not to take this position you have like is this even an option so uh, she was very enthusiastic and uh, her linguistic background and nationality provided her with privilege that um, her white counterparts also shared. Chloe said, um, it's a good chance to travel to a lot of countries around the world that are looking for English teachers. You can go to Spain, Cambodia, Thailand, Korea, Japan, and the United Arab Emirates. Uh, like it's everywhere. If you're essentially being paid uh, because you're a foreigner there, you know, I mean, when they're spe uh, seeking English speakers, take advantage of being a foreigner. It's kind of cool uh, how you get to be like uh, that's a double edged sword. So she highlights uh, the double, uh, double privilege of a native English speaker, speaking teacher, and a foreigner by describing it as a double edged sword. The theme of being an ambassador is also identified by uh, the study by uh, Quinisha Charles that I mentioned earlier. Okay. 
So the next theme uh, is not racism. Well, they were actually discriminated against, but then uh, they say it's not racism, it's ignorance. So compared to these uh, positive narratives, the other side of their foreignness, um, blackness, evoked negative reactions in Korean society. So these women encountered many awkward and strange moments with Korean students and adults uh, who seem to have little familiarity with black people. Kayla, for instance, attributed this to ethnic uh, homogeneity of Korea. But but they attributed uh, Korean people's behaviors and attitudes to their ignorance, misunderstanding, or curiosity rather than racism. Brianna, uh, for instance, expressed her frustration of being constantly commented about her hair. She would say, this is my original hair. You have to say original uh, because they don't under, uh, really understand natural. <laughs> she said, um, and uh, that situation was actually really traumatizing. So it was really difficult because I just felt uh, so incredibly misunderstood. So she was compelled to adapt to the new reality of racialization. In addition, Kayla uh, pointed out the commonly shared prejudice that all black people are uh, constructed as Africans from Africa. And so Kayla said, I think that, um, I think that kind of misconception that all people, uh, all black people come from Africa or Africa is poor comes into play when people are assuming you're from Africa because uh, they associate African skin color with that nationality or con continent, I guess. Um, of course, this country, Korea is still homogeneous, I think, People have to understand that the concept between a nationality and ethnicity is very different. Chloe um, also talked about uh, overt discrimination, name calling, and so on. But she said 85% of the time, it's not racist. It's just curiosity and a little bit of ignorance. And then she continued. You got to go to Korea with a with an open mind, but also be counter based on your race and how you look. Not necessarily out of like racism, but just general ignorance. Like it's not if you're a foreigner going to Korea to visit and you're white, like from Europe or just white, <laughs> then you'll probably have an easier like transitional period just because they tend to look up to European foreigners or people who, you know, are ethnically from Europe, I guess, they take you more serious and like, they, they, uh, I mean, a lot of them. Okay. Um, um, as you see, um, the black female teachers uh, were hesitant to name these instances racism and instead downplayed them as ignorance, uh, curiosity, and misunderstanding. This minimization may be related to the fact that uh, Black female teachers were uh, publicly performing a dual role of YouTubers and teachers in Korea. They didn't wish to de demonize Koreans, nor did they want to unnecessarily construct the oppressed image of Black African women. But these videos demonstrate um, how perceived Korean people's uh, reaction marginalize these women, even though they are native speakers of English from the United States. So uh, Chloe's last comment indicates um, that um, the uh, treatment uh, she received uh, doesn't der uh, derive simply from a binary difference of uh, Korean versus black, but a uh, racial hierarchy that positions whiteness at the top. And let's listen to the rest of this. Surgery Koreans get is to look more like Western. You know, they get, they want their noses more pronounced. They get double eyelid surgery to make their eyes look bigger. 
and you know they try to like wear down their faces so it looks more angular it's like and they keep their skin as pale and as white as possible they will if there's a pole this thin they will stand behind that to avoid the sun if it provides shade it's like they're erasing asian features to look more european and so that these two, the next theme, which is Korean beauty standards for women. So in Korea, uh, women uh, seem to cherish uh, white skin color and uh, facial beauty. For Kayla, Korean society seems to be obsessed with the beauty of face and body shape. So she described how uh, she felt unusual about her experience of applying to an epic position, including a requirement of a headshot head on the application form. She also talked about how Korean society was obsessed with facial and bodily image, including facial plastic surgery. And um, so uh, the perceived beauty standard was indeed that of whiteness. In uh, Brianna's uh, video, she showed a conversation with Jin, an epic teacher friend from Chinese American descent. So Brianna asked Jin about her personal experiences compared to her white foreigner friends. So Jin, a uh, uh, Chinese American uh, uh, teacher said, uh, for sure, the most acceptable teachers are white Caucasians, Blonde hair, blue eyes. That's honestly what most uh, schools want and kids are uh, used to. I think that's what they think of, you know, a lot of the kids don't believe that I'm American. So it seems clear, uh, uh, particularly Korean men uh, desire whiteness, uh, but does this uh, reflect racism? According to Kayla, it's both racism and colorism. So let's just... like korea still has racism colorism going on in the country and i say racism because yes there are racism against foreigners that are here then again i also say colorism because even amongst themselves they comment on the color and the darkness of your skin i had a student tell me that his mother told him to not stand in the sun too long because he was getting dark Okay, so a similar comment, right? So it seems that this uh, racism perceived was not the same as uh, racism back home. So it's more about skin color, uh, preference of whiteness, even for Korean male, than historic systemic, uh, systemic deriving from slavery. So uh, Black female teachers' feeling of being... Uh, and misunderstood seems by Korean white beauty, skin color, facial and uh, body shape, and hairstyle. The following uh, illustration about Korean people's uh, lack of understanding can be interpreted uh, by this frame. Let's listen. They just really have no frame of reference, and that no frame of reference leaves them with confusion, and that confusion leaves them not understanding. And a lot of that they can project onto you, you know, and you gotta like, <laughs> duck and dog. Become easily overwhelmed by being different. Maybe two weeks ago, I was feeling extremely overwhelmed by constantly being different. And there's nothing I can really do to fit in. Well, I mean, I could straighten my hair, but I won't, I will not bend myself to fit their standard of beauty. Won't do it. So Anna's resistance uh, to fitting their standard of beauty seems to signify resistance to white influence beauty standard, her adherence to black identity. So discussion, um, we can see how uh, being black women, um, native English speaking uh, teachers, Africans, uh, America, sorry, American citizens and English language teachers um, intersected and constructed dual subjectivities of privilege or a sense of having a great opportunity and being an ambassador and marginality, a sense of discriminated against. 
And such uh, racial discrimination experience uh, was mostly at the interpersonal level. Such conflicting subjectivity seems to be affected by ideology of ethnic homogeneity, as well as superiority of white native speakers of English. This signals uh, ingrained racism that desires whiteness in the belief system of people and society. So Black female teachers, uh, intersectional subjectivities uh, seem to be uh, reformulated by Korean homogeneity uh, functions as uh, ideology and um, Korean people's uh, stereotypical views of Americans. But they downplayed uh, their experiences of uh, racism and colonialism. This may be by their inter, uh, interpretation of experiences in a different social, cultural, and historical context. Uh, they're being careful not to offend the people in their host country on the online public platform. But this seems to be entangled with their privileged um, subjectivity, which positions them uh, with a role of educating Korean enlightened about the world of diversity. And these subjectivities signify the intersection privilege and marginality, which are embedded in the local and global ideologies and power relations. We get how other um, multiple identity categories intersect each other uh, when Black women travels to work in a foreign location. Study um, also shows a dire need to increase anti-racist understandings in Korea, only embracing diversity. So English language um, education can be a space where anti-racism is addressed and promoted. So in conclusion, I presented both an, an overview uh, of, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, <laughs> an overview of critical race uh, research and uh, teaching and a study on black women uh, teachers experiences in South Korea learn um, how racism and intersectionality work in complex ways shape human experiences and uh, social structures. We need to expand our research and understanding. Or, um, make our classroom and institutions anti-racist um, anti and justice-oriented. Uh, not just at the interpersonal level, but we need to address a systemic racism and our belief system or knowledge system in terms of curriculum and materials. We also must work with the stakeholders to promote anti-racist policies and practices for teacher recruitment and hiring. We also must um, expand our knowledge and understanding of how racism is ex experienced and understand, understood in different geographical locations. And finally, um, we must continue to, raise, to engage in critical race teaching and research with all parties involved in education. And Selected references. And thank you very much. And please contact me if you have any comments and uh, questions. Thank you so much for your presentation, Dr. Kubota. Yeah, I'm seeing people with the emoticons clapping. I very much enjoyed this. It was very fascinating. I appreciated the theoretical context at the beginning and then the fascinating story that showed the complexity of this issue and also the complexity of our experiences, our lived experiences. Um, we have time for questions, so um, you could either chat, uh, put them in the chat. Okay, someone said, how can we access this paper? Or you could unmute yourselves and, uh, you know, speak, 
speak up if you have any questions. But yeah, the first question by Lucinda is how can we access this paper? Yes, um, email me, I can send it to you. <laughs> Do we need to put the email slide back up? Were you able to catch that? Uh, okay, uh, let me see. Thank you. <laughs> Other questions, yep. you can either type them or unmute yourselves. Uh -huh. Michael is also saying that we can put it on Discord. If, if possible, that might be wonderful. Uh, Samantha, you're waving. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm interested in discussing race with my students uh, after that Korean SNL skit thing that happened a couple of years ago. Um, I did a brief topic on it and uh, I felt really unqualified as a incredibly privileged and white American female who's conventionally attractive standards. Um, really intimidating. Um, I first wanna say it's scary. So that makes it immediately all the more worth doing and putting the effort into, but what do you guys think is the best approach to teach students about it? Because again, a lot of the, the girls were saying, you know, it's it's not malicious. The the racism is unintentional. It's it's purely from ignorance, right? So would just exposing children to people of different races be a good approach? I mean, I tried that and some kids were like, ha ha, and they just laughed when there was like a picture of somebody from a different race. And I was like, there's literally nothing funny in this photo. I don't know what you're laughing at. That's why I'm teaching. Anyway, what's the best way to go about it? Mm -hmm. That's a very, um, question. um both question, right? And it's contextual. Uh, I have never taught in Korea, so um, my answer may not be um, very appropriate. But um, I think uh, we need to do like a small steps, right? I mean, we can't really talk about racism. Let's talk about racism. We can't do that. So um, maybe um, try to find some small um, examples, like um, like you mentioned the pictures. You know, people laugh at you know these um, people um, racial backgrounds. Um, I guess uh, exposure. And um, you know, very important, right? So um, and we see um, a lot of um, you know underrepresentation, overrepresent, uh, you know, racial groups in English textbooks. Some characters, um, and we can ask, you know, why, what kind of um, you know racial background this person is from, and why don't we have, you know, different, you know, racialized people in this textbook, right? Why? And uh, the other example that I had, um, I didn't teach this in my class, but there was a very interesting um, picture of um, sort of uh, racial diversity, uh, not racial, that, that, that uh, implicit bias, um, you know, the special issue of a magazine, and uh, this kind of typical um, circle of uh, people, racialized people and the white people, like, you know, circling, and then looking in and, you know, um, and it was very interesting to see. So it's a, it's a circle of people, uh, I think it was six people, uh, two, no, one Asian woman, two Black people, one female, one uh, male, and two white um, people, one male, one female, the person. So um, it's kind of diverse, but depending on where this picture, you position this picture, like, you know, because it's a circle, you, you get a very different kind of um, uh, impression. So um, using, uh, different pictures, different uh, visual images, you know, all these things would be very, very uh, useful because, you know, we don't 
tend to really these biases, right? Yeah. So sorry, I'm kind of you know talking about this in an abstract manner, but yeah. So it just it not necessarily tackling it head on because it's such a huge concept and they're children. Uh, yeah. But just like usually, if I'm gonna Google image or clip art for a power instead of choosing the white female you know go for the stock image of a a washing dishes instead of a, a white woman right pictures that are the opposite of the stereotype yes you know because the, the black lives matter and um racial reckoning um in the years um I, tv commercials they feature um, black family more than so it's been really interesting to see you know how um people media marketing you know more conscious about uh, racial diversity so you know english teachers too right <laughs> so that's um and also questioning um i mentioned that um it would be interesting to talk about uh racial uh, over representation or under of sport teams like you know uh when you look at um figure skaters for example do we see black figure skaters we we don't usually see figure skaters uh who are from black background so why you know we can ask these questions and uh what about like basketball right so it's 